homes lost, neighborhoods evacuated, a stubborn fire burning just miles from here, we'll have a live report. Setback for Putin as a neighboring state wants to join NATO. The latest from Ukraine. The Democratic push to ensure legal abortion shot down. Who are the women most at risk? All that and more on this edition of Chapman News. From Dodge College of Film and Media Arts, this is Chapman News. Afternoon and welcome to this week's edition of Chapman News. I'm Barbara Fox. And I'm Jalea Gillums. We begin this morning with breaking news on the coastal fire in Laguna Niguel. A brush fire that started on Wednesday has now destroyed 20 homes in Laguna Niguel. Over 200 acres have been burned and 900 homes were evacuated due to the fire. We have Alexis Tripke live at the scene. Alexis? The fire that started near a water treatment plant in Aliso Creek and Wood Canyons Wilderness Park has now grown into the coastal fire. The fire burned from San Tropez Street to the surrounding mountains. Southern California Edison officials released a statement suggesting that circuit activity took place when the fire started. Many people are still unsure what the term circuit activity means, leaving the cause of the fire unknown as investigation continues. With over 500 firefighters on the scene, at least two have been hospitalized as of Thursday night, but since released. A care and reception center has been opened for evacuees at the Crown Valley Community Center. Residents are encouraged to follow at OC Fire Authority on social media for updates. A major development that could upset the balance of power in the East. The leaders of Finland announced they'll be applying for membership in the NATO. Finland is a few steps away from beginning their application process, and if approved, this will be an historic expansion of the Western military alliance along the Russian border. Finland's neighboring country, Sweden, is also considering applying for membership to NATO. Russia reacted angrily, saying, Finland joining NATO would make them an enemy of Russia. Kian Havela has more on the war in Ukraine. This week, the House of Representatives passed a bill granting $40 billion in aid to Ukraine. The yeas are 368, the nays are 57. The bill is passed. Some of the money will be used to send U.S. military equipment to Ukraine. The bill also permits funding on more weapons, training, and intelligence support, as well as refugee assistance and public health and medical funds. The multi-billion dollar bill still needs to be passed by the Senate, although Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says they will act on it, quote, swiftly. This package is large, it's very much needed, and I'm going to work with my colleagues to make sure we can move forward on this package as soon as we can. News of the aid comes as U.S. intelligence predicts a prolonged war between Russia and Ukraine. And in Russia this week, a Victory Day celebration to commemorate the anniversary of their win over Nazis in World War II, a revered day in Russian history. During the celebration, Russian President Vladimir Putin condemned Nazis and global war. We are their heirs, and it is our duty to preserve the memory of those who defeated Nazism, who bequeathed to us to be watchful and to make sure that the global war is not repeated again. Putin also tried to justify his invasion of Ukraine, saying that the West forced him into this position. Russia repelled this aggression in a preventive way. This was the only correct decision, and it was a timely decision. The decision of a sovereign, independent and powerful nation. Ukrainians had this to say about Putin's Victory Day speech. I find any speech of his to be a complete nonsense. I, I suppose Everyone now understands that whatever comes out of his mouth are lies. He absolutely doesn't know not like the meaning of the word uh, Nazis and uh, Nazism and uh, fascism. The celebration followed First Lady Jill Biden's surprise trip to Ukraine over Mother's Day weekend. Jill Biden met with Ukraine's First Lady, Olena Zelenska. The two were seen hugging before visiting a school being used as temporary housing for displaced citizens. Also on Mother's Day weekend, 
the U.S. unveiled more sanctions against Russia. The new sanctions include a ban on sales of U.S. services to Russia, a ban on U.S. advertising of broadcasting equipment to certain Russian news stations, a technology exports ban, and visa restrictions. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky promised his citizens a Ukraine Victory Day soon. Very soon there will be two Victory Days in Ukraine, and someone won't have any. We won then, and we will win now. Happy Victory over Nazism Day. For Chapman News, I'm Kiana Favela. A Democratic bill aimed to guarantee abortion nationwide has been defeated on Capitol Hill. The Democrats didn't have enough votes. And with the likelihood of Roe v. Wade going away, we decided to look at three factors that, wa that make women vulnerable, location, age, and income. My decision. My decision. My decision. My decision. What location are women most vulnerable in? Of the 64 million women of reproductive age in the United States, over half of them live in states that would make abortion illegal. That means they would have to travel to states that allow abortion. For example, a woman living in Mississippi, where abortions are already restricted, would have to travel to a place like Washington, D.C. at a considerable expense. And what age are these women? The CDC reports that women in their 20s account for 56.7 percent of abortions. And these women are just starting out in the job market and may not have the resources to travel to a state that allows abortion. Many women already have children. We wanted to know the income level of women seeking abortion. While the women come from all demographics, 49 percent of women are below the poverty line. <laughs> And for the first time since the Supreme Court document was leaked, the court met behind closed doors on Thursday. We don't know what was discussed. Inflation decreased this April for the first time in the past 12 months. But with prices still at record highs, the president says this is his number one priority. One of the key factors is inflation and the price of gas. It seems to set new records every day. Claire Weber has the story. Gas prices are taking the biggest hit across the nation, with the U.S. average price being up to roughly $4.43 a gallon. And here in California, residents are paying an average $1.42 higher than the national number. We're at a local gas station where Orange County residents are paying record highs to fuel their vehicles, as California is the state with the highest gas prices in the nation. We talked to customers to see how these high prices are affecting them. Very intensely. Um, I've gone from about $60 to fill this tank up to $113, $120. You know, of course, it takes out of the kids, like, fun activities, too. So it's a bummer for the kids, and they don't understand. You know, I'm a part-time worker. My pretty much my part-time job pays for gas. I'm an Uber driver. So as of right now, especially a car that takes premium, like, I have to, like, install a Gas Buddy app just to be able to find the lowest gas prices. Three days. Every three days I'm going to do... 120 bucks. Uh, I used to do probably about like five, six hours a day. Um, now I do probably about three. On Thursday, the Biden administration canceled a massive Alaska oil and gas lease sale, creating more political uproar in the prices at the pump. With this, President Biden's approval ratings dropped to near record lows this week. Here, Californians are still waiting on gas rebates promised by the state's government early this year. And according to Governor Newsom, relief might not come until October. I'm Claire Weber, reporting for Chapman News. Gas prices just keep rising. I can't keep up. Well, I can't keep up, I can't keep up with everything that has been happening in Washington, D.C. recently. Me too. With more on your national and local politics is Haley Montez. Haley? Thanks, guys. Jerome Powell will get a second term as the Federal Reserve Chair despite rising inflation. Powell has received criticism in the slow response to the rise of inflation and rising of in interest rates. Many feel that these actions will lead to a recession. However, the Senate gave him a vote of confidence of 80 to 19. Congressman Kevin McCarthy and four other Republican members of Congress have been subpoenaed by the January 6th House Special Committee. The committee claimed they wanted to give those involved a chance to come forward privately but felt that it had been enough time and the subpoenas were an unfortunate necessity. 
This is a major step forward in the January 6th investigation. The committee expects the public to hold hearings next month. Governor Ron DeSantis signed a bill that will recognize November 7th as Victims of Communism Day. But that's not all. The bill will require Florida high schools to teach at least 45 minutes about the victims of communism, describing how the victims suffered under these regimes through poverty, starvation, migration, and suppression of speech. And in local news, after months of protests from local businesses in Santa Ana, Orange County voted to provide $20,000 to those businesses who have been affected by the streetcar construction through 4th Street. That's all for your last political update for the semester. Back to you at the desk. Still to come on Chapman News, the mental health crisis in our own backyard. It may be affecting someone you know. California is still in a drought. We'll tell you how to help and give you your local weather forecast. They call me Maxi, but I prefer Tripod. I was your above average four-legged homie and then wham, bam, minivan. Some people pity me. Now that's lame. I still run, fetch, and swim. And the ladies love me. I'm the ultimate wingman. Just don't ask me to high five. In the past week alone, the California drought has gotten worse, extending from 40 to 60 percent of the state. But are people taking the warning seriously? We went out to investigate. California has been in and out of droughts for as long as we can remember. The longest drought California has been in was a little over seven years, beginning in 2011 and ending in 2019. Three years later, we're right back where we started. More than 93 percent of California is in an extreme drought. But by now, we all know ways we could be saving on water, like cutting down on watering our lawns or taking shorter showers. But why don't Californians cut down on their water usage if they're told time and time again the same tips? Are people tired of the drought? Chapman student Ria Balani says many people are. I feel like a lot of like people in California have kind of come, become complicit because we go in and out of drought so often. So I think there's less of a push to conserve water now. Another Chapman student, Layla Momadi, says she was not aware California was in another drought. I think that the information should be more widespread. Back in 2014, Governor Jerry Brown tried to have Californians voluntarily cut down their water usage by 20 percent, but that failed. It led to the first mandatory drought restrictions. Should we bring back Jerry Brown's mandates? Jack Hole says he doesn't think restrictions are the way to go. I think that restrictions may not necessarily be the best way because as the idea of adding more restrictions means that the restrictions that are in place haven't worked in the first place. I think that, like you said, and I don't know what the incentives are, but I think a clear, cohesive program that is advertised to the public that shows here are the benefits. Again, I have no idea what those are, but if I, as a citizen of the state, feel like that there is a tangible benefit towards preserving water, as selfishly as that sounds, I would feel more inclined to conserve water at that point. Californians used 2.6% more water in their homes during January 2022 compared to January 2020, despite Gavin Newsom urging all Californians to voluntarily cut their water use by 15% last year. Based on the data, it looks like we're going backwards, using more water than before. It seems like the drought is not at the top of some people's minds. Reporting for Chapman News, I'm Barbara Fox. And we can't expect rain anytime soon. It looks like another warm week ahead. This warm weather and drought conditions caused a fire in Laguna Niguel. We have Alexis Tripke live in Laguna with an update on the situation. Alexis? Thanks guys. I'm currently standing in Coronado Point, a neighborhood heavily affected by the coastal fire. Behind me you can see that the smoke is clear and we're seeing some clear skies, but we have a glimpse of a hillside burn, which is just a little bit of what the damage has done by the coastal fire. As of this morning, new reports have shown 25% containment and just 200 acres still have burned as the blaze started two days ago. 
I talked to some residents and they said that tensions are much lower than they have been the past couple of days. As of now, there's still mandatory evacuations for 900 homes. Of the 20 homes destroyed in the fire, uh, there are reports of an additional 11 that have been damaged. We wish everyone affected by the fire remains safe. This is Alexis Trupke reporting live from Laguna Niguel. Now for your weather report, here's Peyton Bell. Thanks, Alexis. Let's get into our weather forecast. Right now in Orange, it's currently a toasty 86 degrees and looking like it's going to stay this way until the evening. Moving on to our national forecast, up in Seattle, the weather's a cool 57 degrees with a mix of clouds and sun, so make sure to bring a couple of layers if you plan on stopping by Pike Place. Moving down to San Francisco, some clouds scattered this morning, but thankfully they should clear up for a sunny afternoon with highs in the upper 60s. Now over in Sin City, another dry, hot day with highs in the lower 90s, so please lather on the sunscreen and stay hydrated. Over in Denver, there will be a mix of clouds and sunshine today with a high of a perfect 76 degrees. And of course, over in my hometown and best city ever, Oklahoma City, hi family, I love you. Today will be a partly cloudy day with the possibility of scattered thunderstorms throughout the afternoon and evening. But as we Oklahomans know, hot and humid can mean dangerous storms. So stay safe and weather aware, y'all. Up in the Twin Cities, another partly cloudy day with highs in the upper 70s. Over in the Big Apple, New Yorkers might see some light showers with a high of 76 degrees. DC will be covered with a little bit of patchy fog this morning, followed by some light rain. Expect a cloudy 73. And of course, down south in Atlanta at 79, Miami, it's warming up a bit at 82. <clears throat> now what you've all been waiting for, our Orange County forecast. It's the warmest here inland in Orange, Irvine, and Mission Viejo in the mid to upper 80s. Moving towards the coast in Newport and Laguna, um, the temperatures are in the lower 70s. But with the ongoing fire in Laguna Niguel, additional portions of South County may be affected by smoke, so please be safe. And finally, for our orange seven day forecast, we are sure lucky, aren't we? It's going to be another warm week here, perfect for the pool. Sunny skies this week with highs breaking into the 90s on Saturday. That's your weekly forecast. I'm Peyton Bell. Now to Sophia Chacon for your COVID update. Thanks, Peyton. President Biden has ordered federal flags to fly at half staff. Biden anticipates the death toll from COVID to reach 1 million deaths very soon. He addresses the significance of this number. <coughs> 1 million COVID deaths, 1 million empty chairs around the family dinner table, each irreplaceable. Across the world, the European Union has lifted mask mandates on planes. Revised recommendations will be released next week, but some airlines will still be requiring masks during travel to and from countries that have the mask mandate enforced on public transportation. There are new discussions about long COVID. Experts say the effects are continuing to increase. The CDC says the symptoms are a wide range of health conditions from fatigue and difficulty breathing to heart palpitations and brain fog. There's not much one can do to help with long COVID either. Long COVID has been predicted to have affected 23 million Americans as of March. Researchers mention how it is difficult to decipher whether or not vaccination helps with the prevention of long COVID, and they also encourage those with underlying health conditions to take extra precautions. Bill Gates has tested positive for COVID. The 66-year-old Microsoft co-founder is isolating at home with mild symptoms. He is vaccinated and twice boosted. Emergent Biosolutions, a huge government contractor, hid evidence from the FDA that 400 million coronavirus vaccine doses were contaminated. It is unclear what exactly contaminated the vaccines. These vaccines were destroyed due to poor quality control and were not distributed to the public. Stay safe, Panthers. And for the last time, I'm Sophia Chacon. Back to you, Barbara. The pandemic has brought on a lot of anxiety, especially to people in our age group. May is Mental Health Awareness Month. Adrian Mitchell looked into the crisis. Helplessness, depression, and thoughts of suicide all have increased in the past decade. We're in a crisis that's seemingly invisible, a crisis of mental health. Depression doesn't, and anxiety don't discriminate. Um, it'll get anyone. Like, you could be on top of the world and it could still get you. 
A recent CDC report shows in 2021, more than a third of high school students said they experienced poor mental health during the pandemic. And 44 percent said they persistently felt sad or hopeless during the past year. Even before the pandemic, up to one in five children in the U.S. had a mental, emotional, developmental or behavioral disorder. And now that we're coming out of the pandemic, things aren't necessarily easier. As we had to learn how to transition out of what was normal, like transitioning out of what has been normal for the last couple of years is still a challenge. Even as I was coming back into a regular routine, you know, there was a little, uh, I, I was nervous and scared, like, oh my goodness, is it safe? And the demand for therapy is higher than ever. A report by University of San Francisco researchers found that if current trends continued, by 2028, there will be 11 percent fewer psychologists than needed to meet California's health care needs. Here at Chapman University's Counseling Services, high demand for therapy has resulted in group therapy sessions and long wait times for first appointments. I waited like over a month for counseling services. Junior Tanchi Mohan said she waited the month because it's even more difficult finding counseling outside of school. Chapman graduate Lindsay Arabian said she struggled with mental health during her time at Chapman, sometimes not even able to attend class. Mental health is kind of, it's, it's, it's essentially almost like breaking your leg, but in your head. Um, and because people can't see it, they are like, OK, this is fake or like this isn't real. But it is real. And experts advise everyone to be aware of the mental health crisis. Even though you don't see it, you know, most people are going through something. And to kind of keep that in mind as we interact with people, not taking things personally, giving people the benefit of the doubt, but treating people with kindness and respect goes a long way. While the pandemic may be ending, the crisis of mental health persists. I'm Adrian Mitchell for Chapman News. Chapman's Rinker Health Science Campus will be hosting a mental health awareness event this Thursday from 11.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. The entire Chapman community is welcome. Breaking news, Tom Brady makes more money than me. More in sports coming up after the break. When I was your age, I was just like you, fascinated by stars. <sighs> but now I get to search for life in the universe. And who knows, maybe life is looking for us too. So we're like aliens to them? Yeah. Does anyone want to be a scientist now? I do. Awesome, we need more girls in STEM. Maybe we can find aliens. Is there alien life in space? We may soon know as NASA is bringing rocks back from Mars. Their robot rover Perseverance is drilling into a crater on the red planet. NASA scientists believe this crater used to hold water, but some scientists and geologists are concerned about what these Mars rocks might bring back to Earth's atmosphere. Possibly alien life forms? Due to this concern, NASA will be very conservative in how they bring back these space rocks. And for the middle of our show, we thought we'd put a spotlight on the middle of our galaxy. Scientists were able to take a photo of the supermassive black hole in the center of our Milky Way galaxy for the first time ever. In order to shoot this photo, scientists lined up at a telescope that spanned across the entire Earth to capture a photo of the black hole 26,000 light years away. Now that we've seen what the holding our galaxy to, to, now that we've seen what's holding our galaxy together, it's time to take a look at the player holding the football world together. Luca Evans is here with your sports report. Hey guys, welcome back to the last sports show of the year and my last sports segment as a senior. Let's make this the greatest one yet. But first, let's start by talking about Brittany Griner, the WNBA star's lawyer, announced today that her pretrial detention would be extended by a month. Here's a photo next to me of Griner exiting the hearing, handcuffed and head down. She's been detained for nearly three months. 
Her lawyer was hopeful Griner's case would go to trial soon, a case the United States has classified as wrongful detainment. But now moving into some Tom Brady news. No, he's not retiring again, don't worry. But Brady will have some nice job security when he does hang up those cleats. An announcement from Fox Sports, he'll join the network as a broadcaster after retirement, signing a 10-year contract worth $375 million. No, I'm just pausing for a while so I can let that sink in. $375 million. He'll be the highest paid announcer on television, and he's literally never done it before. Oh, I'm sorry, what exactly qualifies Tom Brady to talk about football professionally on television more than, say, me? Beats me. I played football, flag football once. I mean, what's going on? But let's stop complaining about money and talk about our friendly neighborhood Halos who are somehow in first place in their division. I've been calling that this is their year now for about three years, so is this actually the year? Well, if Tuesday night's miracle was any indication, the Angels could be singing from heaven this year. Ground ball. Velasquez throws across. He did it! Reed Detmers throws a no-hitter! That's right. 22-year-old lefty Reed Detmers, a top prospect who's had a shaky start to his big league career, came out of nowhere to throw the second no-hitter of his young MLB season on Tuesday night, of this young MLB season, I should say. Detmers was almost in a state of shock after the game, saying it was something he'd been dreaming of ever since he was a little kid. I mean, just a ridiculous game. Mike Trout hit two home runs. Anthony Rendon hit a homer batting lefty for the first time ever. Just for fun? This is just such a fun team. Here, take a look at their home run celebration. Here's Mike Trout after hitting a dinger, putting on a cowboy hat. Yeehaw, high fives all around, and Shohei Otani bombed one, and it's his turn. Man, this is a fun team. Guys, look, can I be part of the fun too? I'm much too frail to hit a home run, but can like pass out water or something? No, I'll give Shohei Otani his honey stingers. Fun fact, I saw in the dugout once that Shohei Otani eats honey stinger waffles. Do with that what you will. But I'll tell you what, that's all nothing compared to what our own Chapman softball team is doing. After the final out of Chapman's win over Redland Sunday dropped into the glove, pandemonium. The 5-2 win clinched the program's first ever Skyhawk tournament title and a bid to the Division III tournament for the first time since 2008. Julia Muniz popped a long home run and a freshman, Miranda Murphy, was awarded MVP honors as Chapman swept their way through the tournament. They're in Texas right now to play Texas Lutheran in round one of the NCAA tournament tonight. Good luck to our Panthers down south. And more on Chapman sports, let's give a quick shout out to Anthony Hart, our athlete of the week, who broke Chapman's school record in the 3,000 meter steeplechase over the weekend. My heart goes out to Anthony. <laughs> in local sports, the Orange Lutheran Lancers are continuing a tradition of incredible high school baseball teams in Southern California. Our own Alexis Tripke has the story. Orange Lutheran High School clinched the Trinity League Conference title with a 13-win, 2-loss record. The high school's athletic department is known for its successful sports teams, and its baseball program is no exception. Ranked number one in California and 19th in the nation, the program has produced players like Yankees pitcher Garrett Cole. But with such success comes pressure. I mean, it's nice being able to be the number one spot, but that means you just have the biggest target on your back. So out of all of it, you're the only team that everyone wants to take down. Players like infielder Mikey Romeo thrive when the stakes are high. I like the pressure on me. Um, I kind of like being in the spotlight. Uh, you know, I'm the guy that if the bases are loaded, I want to be up or I want to get the ground ball hit to me. Head coach Eric Borba believes that this year could finally be the time that his program wins the CIF championship. You know, everything that I can do as a coach to have these guys ready to step on the field from, from the preparation of practice the last week to just, you know, the pregame talks and, and whatnot between myself and the coaches. We just got to make sure we're ready to go. Coach Borba's son, Casey, wants to be on the team that brings his dad the title. I know that that's all he wants. I mean, he's been trying for 14 years here and hasn't done it yet. So, um, again, him, that being his ultimate goal, I think this is our best year to do it, and I feel really confident in it this year. 
Orange Lutheran entered the CIF Championship Games in the top spot, and after a bye week, they faced Bonita Canyon on Tuesday. In a fourth inning rally, the Lancers came back for a 10-5 win over the Bearcats. Olu will play Notre Dame in Sherman Oaks today to determine their semifinal spot. I'm Alexis Tripke for Chapman News. An incredible pool of talent in Southern California high school ball just continues to grow. Well, I'm signing off for the, of the sports desk for the last time ever. It's been a heck of a fun ride. Go follow me on Twitter if you want more unhinged sports takes, and maybe you'll, you'll even see me in this hat sometimes. And before I go, quick shout out to our executive producers and everyone in the studio. You guys make the world go round, and I'll miss every single last one of you. Back to you at the desk. That's our Luca Evans, who recently received a Student Journalism Award. Go Luca! He is our Chapman News celebrity. And with your latest celebrity news, we have Anna Montemore in the studio. Anna? What's up, guys? And welcome back to the one and only episode of Spilling the Monty. Get it? Anna Monty, my name. Anyways, it's piping hot, so let's just get right into it. Starting off with the Billboard Music Awards, which airs this Sunday. Some notable nominees being The Weeknd, who has 17 nominations, and The Queen, Doja Cat, with 14 nominations. Of course, it wouldn't be an awards show without some live performances. Silk Sonic, Ed Sheeran, and Miranda Lambert are all expected to take the stage. But you want to know who I didn't expect in this lineup of, per of performances? Travis Scott. Yeah, you heard that right. Travis Scott is set to perform in the upcoming Billboard Music Awards. This will be his first performance back since the tragedy at Astroworld last November. But there's at least one rapper who's making a comeback that I'm actually excited for. After almost five years of silence, the GOAT is back. Today, Kendrick Lamar is finally making his return with dropping a new album titled Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers. This comes after he released a single on Monday titled The Heart Part 5, which paid tribute to the late Kobe Bryant and Nipsey Hussle. Now, while I've been waiting for Kendrick's new album, I also had to kill some time by watching Selling Sunset. If you're anything like me, you too were wondering if the cast in their new episode would address, you know, the hair tied clothes, the fake phone calls, and the obvious product placement. Well, then you have some very high expectations because none of these things were actually mentioned. Season five was filled with a lot of drama. But I gotta say, it ended the same as every other season. Chriselle single and crying, Davina with no sales to her name, and of course, the most ridiculous outfits I have ever seen. But seriously, I was excited to see all the drama unfold between Christine and the brokerage, but not only did she not attend the reunion, she also publicly has left the Oppenheim group, which with the filming of season six set to start in a few months, I hope they find a new villain because I loved Christine. She brought the drama and I was here for it. Well, that's about all the daddy issues I can handle for one day. But before I say goodbye, I want to give a quick shout out to two amazing professors, Brett Marcus and Suzanne Lysak. It was a privilege to be taught by you both, and I cannot wait to make you guys proud. Thank you also to this class for being the best part of my week. And finally, thank you to my amazing family who has supported me every step of the way. With that being said, signing off for the last time for Chapman News, I'm Anna Montemore. Back to you at the desk. Are you staying up late studying for finals next week? Looking for more than just another bag of Cheetos while studying? We'll have our late night restaurant recommendations after the break. I adopted Bento in 2010 from a shelter. As it turns out, we have very similar personalities and this cat makes me make art because he's always motivating me to take pictures of him, to draw pictures of him. He just is motivating artistically. It's just that simple. Well, he's my best friend, but a lot of people know him as Keyboard Cat. When's the last time you picked up a book? With the boom of social media and the rising popularity of ebooks, in 2019, bookstores were becoming more and more obsolete. But post pandemic, we are living in a reading revival. Emma Sexton, a part time bookseller at a local Barnes and Nobles, has more. In America's largest bookstore chain, Barnes and Noble, sales are increasing faster than ever. Probably haven't seen these sales this good in about a decade. If you're wondering why, that's the same question publishers were asking when books several years old started topping the New York Times bestseller list. Part of this phenomenon can be contributed to the pandemic. 
When the pandemic did hit, and people went back to reading. But a large part of bookstore success is coming from book talk. The increasing popularity of the social media app TikTok led to the creation of the book talk community. Book talk videos act as a word of mouth recommendation system. Luckily enough, a lot of our job is going through TikTok, going through book talk, and seeing these titles, seeing these authors, and making sure that we have them in store, because if we're seeing it, my customers are seeing it, they're going to come in and get it. The book talk platform is not only shifting corporate stores, but the entire publishing industry. Many of its most popular titles are published independently. Lots of other books, uh, fan fiction, webtoons, just all of these millions of very talented writers are finally getting their chance to come to light. By working with BookTok creators, in-person bookstores are growing with virtual platforms rather than being hurt by them. We're very reactive. As soon as something is popular, as soon as something in the media translates to a book, we do what we can to go after that. Sales this past Christmas season indicate that the reading revival is here to stay. For Chapman News, I'm Emma Sexton. I can't wait to read a good book this summer. I mean, I wish I could read right now, but I'm too busy because it's final season for a lot of Chapman students like me. Finals means staying up late to put finishing touches on a project and cramming in some last minute studying. As the clock ticks later and later, students should make sure they're getting enough food into their systems. But what is open at these absurd hours? Adrian Mitchell took a closer look at the late night eats that Orange has to offer. I'm here at Dodge College of Film and Media Arts, and I'm working on some late night stuff for Chapman News. It's finals week and I still have so much work to do, but right now I'm getting pretty hungry. So I'm going to go check out what restaurants are open. It's going to be a long night, but where do I even start? How about a classic burger joint? Even though their front sign is broken, we're in for a good fix after a short drive to Santa Ana. To start off the night, I'm feeling like a big juicy burger and now I could go to a fast food restaurant, but instead I'm at Gourmet Burger, where they have more than just burger including for the month of May, a chicken sandwich that's only $3.99. Let's check it out. And if burgers aren't your thing, that's okay too. We also stopped by Cali Tacos off of Chapman Avenue. The Mexican food restaurant is known for burritos the size of your head, literally. It closes at midnight and has a nice patio area to eat if you don't want to take it back to school. I'm at Cali Tacos and I just got the largest burrito I've ever seen in my life before. Look at this. And I mean, I'm so excited because I'll have leftovers for days. It'll help me with all those late night cravings. I'm gonna go take a bite. Is there a late night eat more classic than pizza? Drive too fast and you might miss it, but I'm going to make sure you keep an eye out for this place. It's open until 2 a.m. and has $2 slices. It's late night and I want some pizza, so where better to go than late night pizza in Santa Ana? It's open until 2 a.m. and it's the perfect place to get some pizza to share with your study buddies. You can get small little pizzas like this or a big pizza. I also got some mozzarella sticks. Just off Main Street is Nguyen's Kitchen, which closes at 2.30 a.m. You can practically smell the banh mi and garlic noodles all the way down the block, or at least in the parking lot outside. It's 2 a.m. and I'm still a little bit hungry, so I'm here at Nguyen's Kitchen, which is our cameraman Collins' favorite place to eat. Before the night ends, we have to celebrate the semester ending with some dessert. Friendly Donuts, whose glowing yellow sign you'll see as you head east on Chapman Avenue, has every donut you could want 24 hours a day. Fun fact, they have different flavors of mochi donuts every month. It's 2.43 a.m. and I'm ready to end this night off with a sweet treat. I have an amazing selection of donuts in front of me from Friendly Donuts, including an ube donut, a guava apple fritter, and two flavors of mochi donut. With all of these donuts, I'm not sure which one I should try first. Um, maybe I'll try the ube? That's all for my late night eats. I'm full and I'm ready to hit the books. I'm Adrian Mitchell for Chapman News. Good luck on your finals, Panthers. I just wanted to say that I was actually the first person to bring Agent to Nguyen's Kitchen. Well, you need to take me there next. That looked delicious. Girl, let's go right after the show. <laughs>
And now it's time to start winding down our show and our semester. For lots of us, like myself, this is our last show with Chapman News. It's time to shine a spotlight on these year's seniors. To all of our seniors, or should I say, students who aren't taking Chapman News anymore. This graduating class, I feel like it's some of the most talented people I've ever worked with, and no one else can do what they're doing. So I'm really proud of what every single person has put into this program and into Chapman and all the work. Seeing how much work they put into everything they do, not just packages, but all the relationships that I saw them form and seeing the time and the energy spent um, to make the show what it is and what I saw, we should be so proud of these people and everything that they do for the program and for each other. Everyone was extremely helpful and collaborative. Everyone's just like, we're here for this purpose of Chapman News and we're gonna put our best dang effort into it. I wanted to thank all the seniors this semester because it was my first semester in Chapman News and they made it so inviting and made me feel so welcome. I was always super inspired by what they're doing and I always wanted to be just like them, getting to work with them on different things. It was super cool because I got to be um, working with these people that I was seeing through sophomore and junior year and we're all in it together now. Seniors of this class did a really great job of helping me get acclimated to the new environment and it felt like I always had at least one senior that could help me in any position. Everyone's talent um, and also just like their relationships already knowing each other was obviously intimidating but I was like I couldn't have had a more welcoming energy coming in. Everyone was they were so like eager to help with any questions I had and <laughs> nobody ever like doubted me because I didn't know very much coming in but they really all like were able to lead by example, but also offer such a helping hand to me always. I am going to thoroughly, thoroughly miss you, and I am so proud of all you have allowed us to accomplish this semester with your amazing work capabilities, work ethic, and passion for the Chapman News program. You all have made this program what it is, and you have caused us to have so many amazing shows this semester, and I am so happy that I've had the opportunity to work with you all and I wish you all the best of luck in your future endeavors. And finally, this afternoon, we'd like to say thank you to our professor, Brett Marcus, as this is his last show with us. Many of us have had Professor Marcus for years, and we can't imagine where we would be without his guidance in this program. We'll miss you, Brett. Thank you. The first memory I have of Brett is when he fell out of his chair during my very first class I ever had at Chapman University. Seeing him at school, seeing his little green car out in front of Mary Knott Studios. Brett was always going out of his way to get me involved in the program and actually was pretty much the only one that really believed that I could do this and I feel like that's why I am here now in Chapman News. My first memory with Brett was actually on Zoom. Brett did not know how to use anything related to technology. He, he couldn't figure out how to unmute himself for like the first 20 minutes of class. I've always appreciated how down to earth Brett is about his flaws and what he does well and what he needs help with. I actually remember the very first time I met Brett. It was my first day here at Dodge. I was so nervous because this is all I've ever wanted. And he was so nice, so encouraging. We watched California Connected, you already know. <laughs> Brett really helped me round myself out and learn all I had to do to get to this role I am in now. And I'm so happy that I met him and he should be really proud of all the amazing students he's helped to teach during his time here at Dodge. You never know what he's gonna say, if it's gonna be a joke or serious, like you never know. In one word, I would describe Brett as a mentor. The blueprint. A role model. Quirky. Perfectionist. Caring. A handful. A hoot. Determined. Supportive. A Jewish New Yorker. Gregarious. You are definitely a Scorpio, and I love that about you. Quirky. He's outlandish. Brett loves LA. Unpredictable. Charismatic. Brett, you're sassy. When he's not angry about early call times or lack of orange juice, it's always um, him telling us that we're really killing it. And that's something that I really value, especially because producing a newscast every week is hard, and we could use all the encouragement that we can get. I just love 
the energy he carries himself with um, when he's working with us and, and you know how he's always able to wrap things around and make a joke out of it because you know news is hard and he's he's able to make it at least for college students an enjoyable thing to do. Brett, I just want to thank you so much for everything you've done for me personally as a young journalist. You really um, started a fire in my heart to fight for things that are really meaningful. I just want to thank Brett for always talking to me when I needed someone to talk to and always giving me the advice I needed. Although you're not going to be here in the fall, I know that you will always be just a phone call away for any of your students. Thank you so much for everything that you've taught me, Brett, and we wish you well on your journey ahead. He taught me a lot about uh, what it means to be a journalist and how a broadcast needs to be run. Brett, thank you so much for everything you've taught me, and I'll miss you so much. Good luck on your next journey. Wow, I never thought I'd actually be emotional um, on a live newscast, but for one last time, I really wanted to thank my own family um, who really like pushed me alongside this journey. And so thank you, mom and dad. And a ginormous thank you to all my Chapman Newsies. Um, these last two years, you've helped shape me in, in more ways than you know. And as a graduating senior, I want to personally thank Professor Marcus for always being there for me and Suzanne Lysak who helped me throughout my job search. And I'm finally happy to announce I'm going to be a news reporter all the way in Colorado Springs. Colorado at KRDO, KRDO 13 News. Congrats, Barbara. I'm thank gonna you. miss you so much and just thank you for everything, honestly. So for one last time, thank you for joining us this week and be sure to check out our YouTube page at chapmannews.tv and make sure to follow us, us at Chapman News. I'm Barbara Fox. And I'm Jalea Gillums and we will see you next semester with Chapman News.